Hello, and welcome to PCB Chat, where we talk with experts across the printed circuit design, manufacturing, and electronic supply chain fields. I'm Mike Buto, president of the PCEA. Flux says every step of the electronic design process is slow, expensive, and error-prone. And the startup company's engineers think they have a solution, a browser-based PCB design platform and programmable simulator. We're going to find out more about that today. My guests today are Matthias Wagner, CEO and co-founder, and Carrie Sheka, whose title is Product Expert. Welcome to PCB Chat, gentlemen. Thanks for having Hi, us. Hi, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having us, yeah. A lot of companies have and are trying to make hardware design easier. Perhaps you could tell our listeners a, a bit about the problem as you see it. Yeah, totally. I can get this a start. I, I mean, how I got into this whole thing, you know, I used to like mass manufacture PCBs, custom electronics in the 2000s, and then got out of it, got more into software, and then I got back into making electronics, you know, through Burning Man projects, and that's how I realized, oh man, why are we not making custom PCBs and instead just duct taping and soldering components together in a shoebox? And then I remembered, <laughs> oh, it's because it's no fun to make PCBs, right? It was supposed to be fun at a solution, and it's just archaic, right, as a process. Um and then I just couldn't let that go, but I was like, well, why, why is it like that? We've made, we've made making software so enjoyable and so given so much power to individuals, you know, and then hardware, we've done nothing. Um, and like, you know, since I'm conscious and alive, you know, um, like I felt like when I went to school in the nineties, these tools were already like outdated, you know, and they hadn't gotten any better in the meantime. And so, yeah, you know, I think the, 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 the beef we had here was like a, that it felt like. Whatever you wanted to do, you had to start from scratch, right? I couldn't just suddenly use a, a, a buck booster from Amazon or from God knows where, you know, to just solder it on. I just had to design the thing from scratch. And it felt like, you know, a buck booster felt like kind of like a solved problem. And why do I have to design this from scratch if I want to have it on a PCB? The next thing was like, you know, that like, yeah, the existing tool chain is just a lot of busy work, right? Like you want... A, a ground flood and now you're sitting there a day and drawing you know polygons uh it felt like being bob ross and not like being an engineer you know um and then the whole piece of like collaboration is just yeah again right the existing software comes from a world without computer networks you know um where we print a pdf and then share that with each other um and like you know working in software or, or, or other fields like design, right? It's like a fully digital process these days, you know, where like things like just sharing a URL or versioning or, you know, creating a, a PR or something like that. It's just, I take that for granted. And in hardware, again, this just was a total foreign idea, it seemed, you know, um, and for no good reason, frankly, right? Um, and so then therefore, right, so that the, 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 yeah, the process of being PCBs is slow and not fun, right? I think about like, so, you know, I, I used to be in the, in the music industry as a, you know, younger person <laughs> in techno music. And so, you know, I've seen that the change from like this software that was designed for like recording to software that was designed to be an artist and be creative, right? So if you think coming from like a Pro Tools and going to Ableton, you know, where Ableton itself, if you're not familiar, is like a, uh, recording uh, a software, music recording software, uh, but people often describe it as an instrument, right? Because it's so fluid, you know, and so designed around like being enjoyable to use and, and uh, like a guitar or something like that, you know? And I think like if you think about uh, uh, electronics design software, it feels very much like Pro Tools. It's a very interruptive process. It's, a very, it's very static, right? Um, it doesn't lend itself to iteration experimentation because it's expensive and cumbersome, Right. Um, I think like a big thing that we have in software and that we take for granted is this ability to like just have these rapid feedback loops, make a change, compile, test, learn, <clears throat> iterate, and, and change again, right? And then hardware, there is this like manufacturing piece that's always in the way. I make a change. <laughs> now, the only way to really test if the change made it better or worse is to manufacture or build the thing, you know, test it and then go back. And so that's oftentimes like a, a multi-week interruption here right where well it turns out that simulators are readily available and good they're just poorly leveraged for example right um same with like you know fitting things into enclosures in the end most pc people end up in an enclosure typically tightly fit and the whole process today to see if it fits the enclosure 
in the digital domain is like incredibly complex. And otherwise I didn't have to like 3D print the board or something to fit into the enclosure and it takes a lot of time, you know? And again, how can we like, like if we, if we just were to shrink these steps into like either being fully automated or a few clicks away, we could iterate faster, therefore experiment more, you know, there'd be less risk. And then I guess as a result, I think hardware would be less hard, you know? And I think that's also another key insight here that software is not inherently easy. So we made that easy. You know, we've built great ecosystems and tooling to make that easy. And we want to do the same for hardware. And now a brief word from our sponsor. This episode of PCB Chat is sponsored by PCB East, the electronic industry's East Coast conference and trade show. Coming to the Boston suburbs, May 9 to 12. And registration is now open at PCBEast.com. So you, you mentioned the simulator, and I do want to get into that in a moment because you do have a, mm -hmm. a spice simulator. Um, mm -hmm. But first, I, I'd like to just talk a little bit about your team. It comes from a bunch of random, little-known companies, right? Facebook, Apple, NASA. I mean, I'm guessing the most you're, random, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing your experience with these problems firsthand is what inspired Flux. I mean, that's what you were just talking about. Yeah. I, you know, I believe in this idea of like cultural problem fit. So I think, you know, what made ultimately Google succeed or Apple succeed is that they figured out the, the culture and the combination of people that were best suited, the most competitively suited to solve that the problem that these companies were tackling. Like for example, like Google people are very academic and that works well to build like a giant search engine where you like have <clears throat> the whole internet cache. At Facebook, right, it turned out that to compete in social networks, you had to move fast and, and measure and have this like this like really quick loop of like trying something, measuring the output, and then iterating on that, right? And that was, you know, the competitive winner. And, and for, for Apple and each company, it's own. And so for us, I realized it's like, look, we need on one side people who are really passionate about hardware and have experience just like carry here, who have done the job for like, you know, five, 10 plus years on the high end. On the other end, we need people, right? If you think about our product designer, Brooks, right, who has worked at Salesforce and understands designing enterprise software, but it also worked on, on Facebook and on stories and camera there and understands consumer product design. Because I knew that like if we wanted to, to win here, right, this wasn't going to go by me having stakes with, uh, uh, with CTOs uh, at big customers. It was going to be that we win over the individual engineer. That's like a bottom-up movement here, really. And so then the product had to be really, really good, really accessible, really enjoyable. <clears throat> and consumer software is oftentimes designed like that. So, so that's how, how that fit in. And so, but yeah, then we also have like people like, you know, this is all lives in the browser. It's GPU accelerated. We needed people who like knew about programming GPUs, you know, to make this all happen. So we brought people in from there. And I think that's kind of like the culture that I tried to create, you know, that was like uniquely qualified to solve this problem we're facing here. Because also like what people have tried to solve these problems for something before, it's just that they've all failed. Uh, and so trying to come like, from the outset here and trying, trying a different approach, I think was key. Carrie, you know, I know that uh, in your past you worked uh, in development for one of the most popular products really in the history of the world. I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure what you can and can't say about that, but could I ask, are the types of problems that Flux is attempting to resolve, um, were those problems that you ran into at that large company and were those things that you talked about with your fellow engineers? Yeah, absolutely. So I you had that. access to, and I'm sorry to jump in here, but so you had access really to the leading edge tools at that time. I mean, everyone, you know, your supplier, and I know who you guys are using, was probably bending over backwards to accommodate you, and yet you were still running into issues. I think I can talk a, a tiny bit about that. I don't want to go too into detail. Um, I think it would surprise a lot of people to hear that even while developing the iPhone um, we didn't have incredible tools. I think we were using um, maybe a, a five-year-old version of one of the major software platforms, and we had to use it through a Linux uh, terminal because we were developing on Macs. All Apple products are developed on other Apple products. Um, and so we experienced a lot of problems. It was very difficult, and there was a lot of overhead in trying to kick out these um, really high-quality designs, and often we were fighting the tools. And so... Um, you know, this frustration has built throughout my career with how difficult it is to build hardware. And it's not because the process of building hardware is supposed to be difficult. 
I think um, by and large, it's because the tools haven't been designed to to address some of these things over time. And like Matthias was saying, there hasn't been a ton of innovation in this space. And so that's really what brought me to Flux is um, addressing these problems that I've experienced along the way and, and helping make sure that other people don't experience those problems. And I think that those problems are such a barrier to entry to so many people. And I just want to see everyone who has interest in creating hardware have the ability to do so. We want to make tools that are incredibly powerful, but also simple enough that anyone can use them. So, you know, it, it's true that, you know, ECAD is based on platforms that are decades old, at least, you know, the, the most, I'll say popular, um, uh, the most used uh, programs that are out there. Uh, do you think that um, a, a tool that is uh, browser-based or perhaps even app-based um, uh, would be more fitting with where today's users, I mean, the next generation um, is coming from? Uh, something that could keep, you know, where you would have blocks or modules and you could just keep u- reusing those known data? Yeah, I think that's a really great segue into some of the core value of Flux. Um, I think Matthias mentioned earlier, one of the things that's really difficult about making hardware is that you're always starting from scratch. And um, I don't see why that's necessary. I think one of the things that I've noticed, um, I I worked at Apple and then I worked at a small startup making some intelligence equipment for U.S. special operations groups. Um, And then I uh, was consulting for a few different companies after that. And one of the things that happens when you go from company to company is you create your own library each time you have some parts that you're interested in working with and you know them and you, and you want to continue using them. And then you go to another company and then you, have, you spend your first month creating that parts library that you already were, were using somewhere else. And that's a month of completely wasted time. And so um, we think that there's a huge opportunity in removing that wasted time. And so anytime um, anyone makes a part in Flux and chooses to make it public, that's available to everyone. And, and so you can start from that. Um, the same is true of these things that we call submodules. And so people spend time making the perfect buck converter or the perfect USB-C connector along with the associated circuitry. And that includes the layout. And so you can just drop that block in and all of a sudden you have USB-C um, in your design without having to know the ins and outs of how USB-C works. And so that's one of the core philosophies here. Um, and we think that that'll help make it a lot more accessible to people. How much should I trust somebody else's parts library? That's a great question. Not that you choose to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I mean you, know, you have a different assembler, even if, even if you have the same, you know, outline package style, et cetera, from assembler to assembler, there's tolerances and it may not work perfectly from, you know, from my assembler to your assembler. Yeah. I think, you know, to chime in here, I think you have the exact same problems in, in software too. Why should I trust somebody else's encryption library? Well, it's a choice you're making, right? You can trust them by reputation. You can trust them because you have read the source code and you're an expert yourself, right? It's like, you can also just try it out and see if it works for you. Or like, you know, maybe encryption, you need it, but it's not the most important thing to you. I think there's, I think there's a bunch of variables here. And I think that translates well into electronics, right? It's like, in some cases, you just trust the author, right? In, in other cases, you trust the statistics that this has been used successfully many times, right? And in other cases, you'll, you'll inspect it yourself and make sure it's right, you know? And in some cases, you'll decide to, you know, because you are the world's foremost expert on encryption, you're going to run your own library. And, and, you know, in electronics, the same. You're going to run your own, uh, design your own component from scratch, you know? Um, I think what we're trying to do is just like, you know, make that easy, um, make it easy to explore the other options that are out there for you, make it easy to compare them, you know, make it easy when you have something you think is better to share that with others, you know, make it easy to like say, hey, look, what you have, there's actually pretty cool. There's one thing missing, I think. Let me propose to add that here, you know, or fix that issue you have here, right? And so just like a more, you know, collaborative aspect to it. In journalism, this is what's known as bearing the lead. You know, we talked a bit about, you know, your background, you know, what the problems are, the nature of the problems. Now let's talk about what Flux actually does. It's more than just parts layout and placement. Um, but let's, let's just hear it from you. Yeah, you want to take that, Kerry? Yeah, I think that for me, I think as we were talking about earlier, there's so much frustration in the hardware space. And so on one level, Flux is about removing those frustrations in that process and making hardware more accessible. 
uh, I've seen on my own side, I, I was working on a hardware startup before joining Flux, and um, I had spent some time in another tool trying to create a board for myself, and it took me about three weeks, and I was really frustrated with the process. It ended up not being super high quality. And so then um, I decided to try and make that board in Flux, and it sped up my process so much I was able to complete that board in a day. And that really showed me the value of this idea. And that's when I decided to join the company full time. So that's one aspect of it. It's also um, reimagining some of these features that we've thought about for so long as a given. Like I think impedance control is a really good example. Why do I have to go and use an external calculator or talk to the manufacturer in order to calculate my trace, uh, uh, my trace width and spacing? Um, you know, that's something that is clear based on my stack up and so and and my desired impedance. And so I think that the tool should just do that for you. And so um, Flux is trying to make that process a lot faster um, by going through all of these different features, um, going one by one through all of the pain points and saying impedance control takes a ton of time and it's very inaccessible. And so let's go in and, and fix that process. Manufacturer integrations is um, another another um, area so currently, once your board is done, you're not finished with your work. You have a ton of work to do in order to um, get this built at a manufacturer. Many companies have people whose entire job is to manage that process. And so we're looking at ways to, to make that a little bit more automated and take some of the pain points out. So I think it's just holistically looking at this process and, and making it much simpler and much easier. Yeah, I think a takeaway was for us right, that if you look at existing tools, they just capture like a very tiny slice of the process. And really what I face as an engineer as a problem is the, the whole end-to-end -end thing, right? Or as a team, the challenge that I face. And so I think right, this, this goes beyond just capturing a schematic, laying out a board. This is about procurement of components, right? Finding replacement for components, right? Getting the thing manufactured, keeping it manufacturable, right? And so in that sense... Yes, we want to, but a, a dream we what we say that we that we have here is that we, if you think about how easy it is today for a twelve-year-old to build an iPhone app, we want to make it as easy for them in the future to build their own iPhone, right? And so a lot of automation comes in here, a lot of collaboration, right? Being able to leverage other people's uh, great work, um, but so then also you start realizing, you know, why this makes sense to live in the browser, because you know you want to be able to have your friend across town or across the pond people to review your board or help you debug something or make a suggestion, figure something out. If you're like part of a team, you want somebody, uh, you know, the supply chain folks, you know, to have access here in real time to, as the designs are shaping up, to be able to see, you know, what can they get? <clears throat> what do we need uh, more stock of? What do we need to have cheaper, you know? Because um, this is a collaborative process in the end. This isn't like something where we just work on our own for three months and then throw something over the fence, which is how works in most cases today it's a very waterfall kind of model you know and i think we want to like enable a much more agile model where it's really easy to to get input and get unblocked from, from other stakeholders you know in the organization and so again nothing will beat here ever to just be able to copy paste the url and send it over via slack or email or uh, uh whatever you choose here um yeah and that's the power of applications and browsers you know just like fluidity so, Kerry, I didn't realize that you were a user before you became uh, an employee. So that's that's really actually very interesting to me. So let me walk through here just to sort of recap all of the features that Flux can do. Okay, so schematic capture, correct? Mm -hmm. Parts placement. Yep. Routing, layout, simulation. Mm -hmm. You have uh, collaborative aspects, which I want to get into. Yep. And then you can export the data to uh, the PCB fabricator in which formats? Gerber, probably? Yeah, we support Gerber. You know, we're working on direct integrations with manufacturers. So that all you have to do is like, hey, look, send me 50 units, you know, assemble to my doorstep. And then the other thing we have is also like, you know, just uh, uh, supply chain tools, like uh, uh, real-time availability of like pricing and stock for components at different distributors. So like, that as you design your project, you know, you you can keep easily an eye on like, hey, look, is this going to be manufacturable? Is this going to be within budget here, what we want to do? 
Yeah, one other big one is version control. There's built-in version control. I mean, how many times have you tried to integrate your existing workflow with Git and then you're working through that process and then you forget all the Git commands and so you got to go look them up and then go through this crazy process just to keep your uh, workspace up to date? So that's all built in and you can traverse your history and, and step forward and backward. And, and that's a really powerful addition as well. Now, we mentioned earlier about the SPI simulator. So you can test circuits with real parts and environments. Mm-hmm. The simulator is hosted on the browser rather than in the cloud, correct? Mm-hmm. So that suggests to me that it's designed to be faster. That's correct, yeah. Another advantage is that the simulator is programmable. What exactly can users themselves customize? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm assuming I will say, first of all, that we're incredibly early here, and, uh, uh, and this isn't like the, the final state of everything. But what we've built, essentially, we've made the tool itself fully programmable. Um, and so if you think about components, typically you think of them as like a, look, you have the symbol, you have the footprint here, maybe simulation models, some metadata, that's it. In Flux, these components are like little apps, right? They're Turing complete and you can fully automate them. And that leads to some, a bunch of great innovation, not just for simulation, uh, but also for other things. I mean, something that users have invented here, I guess I could say, is like something, the idea of a generic resistor, generic capacitor, where you can just grab one of them. You can not just change the capacitance, but you can at any point in time change the footprint, you know, the package code here, uh, and go back and forth without having to like replace the component. And so it's like just lots of little tools that users build here and how they improve the ergonomics of these components that they use. And so if you now take that to simulation, it's the same thing, right? So today, unfortunately, you can't just like, you know, put your Arduino code or whatever firmware code you have into Flux and run that in the simulator. This is something we want to enable in the future. Uh, but what you can do today is that you can mock the behavior of the MCU within your circuit, right? You can like essentially program all the uh, uh, common cases or states that the circuit will be in, you know, given a certain uh, firmware state, um, and then run through those, you know, and, and debug those and test those, you know. And, and so that's powerful in and of its own. I think, you know, another idea we have is to introduce the idea of, like, unit tests, right, to your to your schematic, where you can say, hey, look, uh, a given uh, input X, we expect output Y, you know. Like, let's say if, if we send 5 volts on pin 14 of the MCU, then on pin eight, we expect a sine wave to come out with this frequency, right? Um, and so to, yeah, again, right, to, to enable faster iteration here for users, you know, uh, and enable them to catch issues before they go into manufacturing. You know, I, I always remember this, like, yeah, they said horror stories that Carrie shared, right, where they would just, before manufacturing run, they would just spend, you know, two weekends locked up in a conference room, you know, with colored markers, you know, going through the the printouts of the schematics, right, to identify any possible issues. And it's just like, you know, I think we can do better here. This isn't, you know, this isn't acceptable, you know, as a workflow. I've been told that you have a huge announcement coming out. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think, you know, the, the product is called Flux.ai, and not just because the domain was available, but because, you know, we always felt like, look, we can leverage more automation here. Um and, and not just like static automation, like if you think about the, the, the ground fills we do automatic, that's like a static process, right? Where we just fill empty space. But um, if you like think about AI and if you think about uh, 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 ChatGPT and all the uh, uh, interesting stuff that came out here, it's like, but how can we leverage these technologies for uh, PCB design, right? And I think there's these like age old ideas of like AR auto routing and AR layouting. But I think it goes much deeper, right? The, there's at any, for, just for example, at any given moment, right, there's about 250,000 relevant components in the marketplace, you know? And who in the right mind knows all these or knows all the, the specifications or the pricing availability? You just don't, right? But with AI here, we can make this really accessible. You can like look at any given component and you can just ask things like, hey, look, what's a cheaper replacement for this? What's a more reliable replacement? You know, what, you know, these, this crystal I put together here, these like eight components. Is there like, can we replace this with one component? You know, um, this MCU here, did I wire this correctly? And these are all things that like a real flesh and blood teammate often, you know, gets pulled into, but the eye can do this just as good and in some cases better. And I, Kerry can maybe share here some of his favorite use cases, but it's really mind blowing what we're seeing here and we're coming out with a feature here, feature set around that. So you're talking about AI applications in Flux. Can you tell me a bit about what type of machine learning that you're using? Yeah. Like, is it supervised or unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning? 
Yeah, good question. I mean, so what we're launching with, you know, is like the 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 LLM models that are very popular now. You know, where you have to have a, a model pre-trained on what they call world knowledge, right? So that that includes um, physics, right? Uh, electricity, uh, how to lay out a board, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, and so then, in, in with these models, right? Once you feed it the data that, for example, exists in your project, so we can provide that model with the netlist, with the bomb with the layout, you know, and all sorts of other metadata with the data sheets and your components, right? We can hook it up to um, our part availability and pricing uh, services internally, right? And so with that then, right, you can have a conversation um, yeah, about your project with the, with the AI model, right? And so you can ask how to solve problems. You can ask, hey, look, this resistor, why is that needed? And it will explain to you, you know, what it does in the circuit, you know, and why it's needed or why it's not needed, Right. Um, you can you can ask for replacements. You can ask, be like, hey, look, this design here is what I want, but we need this to be cheaper or more reliable, or we need to find components where there is more stock, and it can perform all these tasks for you, right? It's like even we have even prototypes here where it like it can s create a project for you from a project description. You can say, hey, look, I need a server control. I need to cons I want an ESP32 here at the core of it. I want to control 18 servers with this thing, you know. The, the the voltage right you, right you can do the whole description and it, it can create the bomb and the netlist for you and then you can iterate on it be like okay look this is like nice but let's i want to make this change that change can we not make that change and you can have a conversation like you would with a with a human teammate it's mind-blowing how well it works and how accurate it is and carry okay, you want to show you some of your favorite use cases yeah definitely so I think there's been a lot of conversations about, um, you know, when ChatGPT first came out and it was version three or whatever, maybe it was stumbling over some questions or maybe it wasn't relevant to some spaces. And there were a lot of conversations like, will this ever, how will this ever apply to the hardware space? How will this ever apply to the software space? And I think with some of the recent developments that have been made and some of the integrations that we've done with some of the project data, um, it's shocking. I'm genuinely humbled by a lot of the responses that I'm getting from this thing. And I mean, I've been in industry for 10 years. I've worked at Apple and some other major uh, companies and learned a ton along the way. And I'm not trying to say that any of that was wasted effort, but it really blows me away when um, this thing has, you know, a similar amount of knowledge in, um, in a bunch of different areas that, that I do. And so, you know, I spent a bunch of time uh, testing this feature and um, I was really shocked by what it was able to do. It's able to, um, you know, in, in a very simple case, I dropped two LEDs down and I wanted them to be driven by an STM32. And I said, hey, um, what would be my uh, resistor? Can you calculate the current um, limiting resistance value for LED1 and LED2 driven by U1? I didn't even specify any of the part numbers. And so it went into the data sheet, understood the requirements of the LEDs, understood the specifications of the microcontroller, and then calculated exactly in the same way that I would have done the resistance value. And, you know, this is sort of a funny anecdote, but I feel myself getting a little bit lazier and lazier with the things that I'm willing to do math on for, my, for myself and starting to use the, the tool instead. Um, one of the other things that was really incredible is in that same design, I asked it, um, have I connected uh, this micro does this microprocessor have all of the connections that it needs in order to function properly? It's a very general question. And what it said to me was that, um, no, you actually need a 10K pull-up uh, to VDD on your reset pin, and you need to either pull boot uh, down or up, depending on your use case, and here's when you would do those things. And so um, it also said, you know, crystal is optional depending on if you want it to have, use its internal clock or not. And so um, I just felt like, this is really true to the value of Flux, which is giving this information to people who wouldn't otherwise have had access to it. And I just think it helps make this space so much more accessible. Can you talk a little bit about that decision tree process? Um, and I know that you don't want to give away the farm here, but you know how shared is the AI? For instance, if Carrie at Apple works something out, will Matt at Facebook be able to take advantage of it? Yeah, good question. I can speak to that. Our current approach here is that we only use data, it's either your own data or that was shared with you explicitly uh, for training these models. I personally think that's like a fair delineation. There is, I think, you know, 
electronics is old enough as a field, I think also that like, you know, there isn't too much secret knowledge. It's more about like, yeah, sure. You know, you just have different learnings in your organization, how you want to do things or for your specific domain, how you want to do things. And that's a more organization specific and not so useful anyways outside, right? I, you know, we, we talked internal about things like, yeah, in, in large organizations, there will be like a, a Flexboard expert. And that expert has learned from, you know, past projects in that organization, what to do, what not to do. And like, sure, you, and you're always trying to get time from that guy, you know, but what if we could just like have an AI model learn from that company's past projects, successes and failures, right? And then shrine that into like a, a fuzzy model that now you can run automatically on your designs as they go out, where that expert now can still come in and review that, you know, but you look, you, you, you solved 80% of the problem here up front, you know? Um, maybe that's another good segue here to also say, like, I don't think that AI takes the human out of the loop, right? I think it's an extension of the humans, right? Well, I would agree with that. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, we saw that right with chat GPT, how often uh, the humans, <laughs> you know, hacked it and <laughs> sort of reoriented it a little bit, maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, let's not, let's hope that doesn't happen here. Um, Several ECAD companies, large and small, are applying some form of AI to PCB design. From my vantage point, most of them, if not all, started with routing and some have added placement. But, and here's the big but, uh, it's only really been proven out on simple boards. So when it comes to high-speed boards with HDI or other more complicated fabrication requirements, they all run into the same problems that the ECAD companies did which is to say they can't do it yet or they can't do it really well or, you know, it requires, you know, quite a bit of, um, of tricking the system. So, you know, and I'm, I'm seriously, I'm trying to be pragmatic here. I'm not trying to be cynical, but w where's your upper end constraint right now? I mean, you know, what have you actually proved this out on? Yeah, good question. So we don't offer auto routing today, you know, um, for the reasons I think, I think it's A, hard, but it's also B, it's very subjective. I think, you know, an, a static auto router or even an, a machine learning based auto router, like what you see out there can come maybe up with a working solution, but not a solution that a human is able to review or, or reason about anymore. And that's a problem, right? And so I think more work needs to be done here to come up with solutions that a human can still reason over, you know, especially for complex boards. And I think that's a huge issue here. Uh, I think how we think about it is like, you know, that like for many of these use cases, however, these like, these are conversational. So they, for, if you think about AI, it's like the, the one-shot AI kind of thing, which is like what, you know, all of the competitors have like tried out, you know, where like you somehow configure it and then it just spits something out and then that's just it. And if you want something different, you have to like try a different configuration. Uh, and then you have this new idea that ChatGPT really introduced this conversational AI, right? Where you can iterate through conversation um, on a problem. Um, and so we think that has, you know, uh, uh, that's the way to do it really. Right, because otherwise it's like asking another human to read your mind and do it exactly the way you would want it to be, and that's just not. But right? humans can't do that, and machines can't do that either, you know. Um, so I think it has to be like you know a, a, a bidirectional process, you know, of iteration. Uh, you know, a, a favorite use case I have is that, that Kerry once shared is like you know when when they had to like on a project move a hundred traces a little bit to the left, right? They would outsource that, right? There was like an offshore you know, a shop that would do that overnight for them. And I think these are the things that AI can do for you. You'd be like, hey, look, this is all great, but now we need to move the MCU, right? A centimeter to the left or whatever it is. And we need to move all the traces. This is the stuff that AI can do really well, you know? And where you can like be like, okay, I, I like this directionally. Here's like a couple of things we need to change about that. And you just tell it that, you know, and it can make these corrections really well. Um, One of the things that, you know, over the past several years, I've talked to a lot of startups in this space. So some of them tackle parts libraries and, and models. Uh, some of them have tried to work on supply chain issues, being able to go out and find those components and, and getting them in the hands of the design engineer quickly. Uh, some of them have worked on, you know, routing. You know, I've had some that have worked on debugging at the back end that have, you know, printing out their PDFs and doing everything manually. I mean, it's just, you know, the crazy stuff that, you know, that Carrie was talking about earlier, just how much time it took to do what should have been automated processes. Lots of companies that are trying to tackle these tasks, Flux is doing almost all of that 
in one shot. I mean, this is really ambitious. You're trying to tackle a lot here. How many engineers or developers do you have working on all this? Yeah, good question. So I will say up front that like, a lot of people try to talk me out of this, you know, when we, when we started the company. <laughs> I, I, you know, a lot of people were like, no, this is really hard materials. You underestimate how hard it is to build CAD tools or eCAD tools, yada yada. And I was like, look, I believe that this is what the future should look like. And everybody I talk to in the field agrees with me. And so all that we need to do is to just build it. And I don't care how hard it is, you know. Um, I love hard problems, you know. I need the intellectual stimulation, frankly. You know, I always, I told early investors, right, that, so, you know, I've been organizing a Burning Man camp for over 10 years. And I love nothing more than being out there 110 degrees, you know, working 18 hours a day. I love that. Give me more of that, right? I like the, the actual event is almost boring to me because what I live for is out there and just working as hard as you possibly can under terrible circumstances with terrible equipment sometimes, you know? <laughs> um, I love that. So uh, so this felt like, you know, something that would like entertain me for a while. And that's why we got into that. I will admit though that like, I think it was definitely harder than I thought it would, that I thought it would be that people told me it would be. But, you know, we're here now, you know, it's taken three years to to build the, the one of the product but we have it now, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I, I live to prove the naysayers wrong in that sense. And we, of course, had looked into like just building a plugin for existing tools or some add-on kind of thing. But, you know, there was like such a huge graveyard out of these attempts that that was clearly not, that was clearly not working. Right. And I think we always came back to that, that the problem is that the design process is rotten at the core, which is that the design tools are absolutely terrible. And it, the best plugin you could build wouldn't solve this. You know, that you would spend most of your time also on the integration with that tool, because let's be honest, right, the the APIs that these tools offer are like, I mean, they're awful. The file formats are just catastrophically bad, right? Um, and so by us in having, you know, taking the risk and putting in the effort to build our own design tool from scratch, we don't have to deal with any of that, right? Um, and, and and so we con we control the full yeah we control the full experience here right and that allows us to move really fast and just get things right and not spend our days with trying to like somehow work around the, the archaicness of some file format or some some existing design tool and I think that's what that's how we are fast you know we're a team of twenty one but we make it look like two thousand because we don't have to deal with all that craft in the industry yeah I think it's incredibly ambitious to have developed the entire tool from scratch but I think that's the requirement. I think because we've spent so much time developing the tool from scratch, now we can build all of these amazing things on top of it that I think uh, one of the reasons why other companies have failed in the past is because they didn't bite off so much. They didn't develop the tool from scratch. And so they're stuck all day writing integrations with other tools. And that's, that's how they spend their time. That's all they end up doing. And yeah. so because we have all of this um, existing work here, now we can build all of those awesome features. <clears throat> it's also like a, a common observation in my career that like a lot of people, they just don't dare to dream large enough, you know? So, um, yeah, I have a son who's a 17-year-old, a junior in high school, and, and my wife and I battle over that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> On which end but of the honestly, spectrum? <laughs> yeah, but I, honestly, you know, I mean, look, my own belief is that the future of hardware design actually is residing in my basement and basements all over the country, right? Yeah. It's, it's kids who are playing Minecraft and learning to think in 3D mm -hmm. and, you know, you learning to reuse things that they've developed over and over and again to create something much bigger, figuring out those shortcuts. Yeah. I also... Goosebumps. Yeah. I have goosebumps when you say that, you know? So you, you do partner with, it, it appears, with, uh, with KiCad. Is it that you just take data in from them um, and then folks can then place and route and, and do simulation in your environment? Or is there something more to that? Yeah, no, I think, you know, it was just a, a pragmatic kind of move. Uh, there is a lot of existing uh, content out there for KiCad. They have, they're the only ones who ha even attempt having a public documentation of their formats. You know, the formats are all text file based. So that was just the easiest to to get going with. When when companies are partnered with the the lower profile ECAD companies, it suggests to me that the market you're going after first is hobbyist, not a professional designer. But it sounds a little bit like that's not the case. Can you talk to that? No, 
people always think that, right? That Flux is for makers, and that's not true at all. Like, you know, we build, first of all, we don't think about users that way, right? What we think about is, right, this dream that we have that we want to enable a 12 year old to build their own iPhone, you know? And so, what's the capabilities then that you have to put into the tool to enable that? And I think then, of course, right, as a trickle down effect, if you, if you do that, then imagine the power you've just given a professional. Right? Or like a, or a whole team of professionals, right? But they can do now suddenly, and so that's how we think about it. And so, and if you look at the actual, if you look at the actual adoption of Flux, I think what we see most often is that, first of all, the majority of user base is professionals. Uh, typically, they come in and they use it for one or multiple hobby projects first, you know, because it turns out that almost all professional electric engineers also do this as a hobby in their garage on the weekends, right? Um, and then from there, they take it to work. Right? They use it for like a small thing there first, you know, for like a little side project, a little exploration they're doing, right? Um, and, and then, you know, they, they copy paste the URL and they, they share it on Slack or send it to the coworker on the desk next to them, you know? And, and that's how it grows in, in organizations, you know, like very organically and very fluidly. And so that's just again, right? We don't have salespeople here, you know, because we don't need to, you know, we're building a product that speaks for itself, you know? Uh, and that we made it really easy for you to sh share and use that product with others, you know? Um, and that's what we believe, you know? We don't believe in uh, spending here uh, uh, resources uh, on some procurement requirement list, you know? That's artificial and makes no sense, you know? Made by people who have never designed a board in their life, right? We don't believe in any of that. We believe building the best tools we can for the engineers and that everything else would flow from there. And then so far it has so, Matthias, what is the cell model? Is it a cost per seat or is it based on functionality or time-based? Yeah, it's what they call this a freemium model. So, we're free tier. That's very similar to like, you know, what you, what you know, maybe from GitHub, you know, where like we cap you essentially how many private projects you can have. For Flux, it's capped, you can have up to 10 private projects on the free tier. Otherwise, you have all the same features available than and on the paid tier. And then right now we have one paid tier. It's $14 a month. And the only difference here is now that you can have unlimited private projects. And it's as simple as that. Like, we're not here to, like, you know, extract obscene amounts of cash from you for almost no value in return. I think what's going to happen down the road, you know, we're going to at some point offer team tiers that are catered more towards, like, the professional team. And then ultimately probably also, like, some sort of, like, enterprise tier, you know, that's more customized. But, yeah, that, that's the monetization model as is. But currently, no restriction on number of nets, number of parts, number of layers, anything like that. No, I think that's stupid. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so, are you at revenue right now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A healthy chunk of the active user base is monetized. I will say that, like we're here, like I think the current phase we're in is really around driving market adoption. I think you know that like, where we experience friction on that regard today is like where we lack the capabilities. You know, because we don't have full capability parity with existing tools. And that's like something we're, we're putting a lot of resources into closing that gap as fast as we can. I think, you know, we're like maybe like a year out from having, you know, closed the, the most significant amount of that gap, you know. Um, yeah. And just in some of my prep for this uh, podcast, it looked like you have a pretty good funding situation as well. Yeah, we raised $15 million dollars from investors to date. So yeah, you know, you're well here equipped, you know, to, 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 to walk the long walk here, frankly, you know, and that's what we've always pitched investors that this wasn't going to be like an overnight success. This was going to be an overnight success 10 years in the making, you know? <laughs> and so again, right. It's like dreaming big here. Right. And just acknowledging that like, this is a problem worth fixing with a very large market that would only be larger if the tooling was better and the ecosystem was better and that it's worth putting so much time of our lives in here up front, you know, to solve that. The Flux is browser-based. Which browsers is it optimized for? Good question. I mean, you know, it's like most of us use Chrome, either on Windows or Mac here. Uh, we do have some Safari users. Um, and then we also have, like, I think, one or two internal Firefox users. And I'd say, like, you know, it's generally uh, 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 we wanted to fully work on these three browsers. Oh, I, I forgot Edge. Uh, at least one or two internal uh, teammates also use Edge. So in these browsers, you know, the expectation is that it fully works. 
I'm trying to remember, is there any, any other relevant browsers these days? I mean, I think there's actually like boutique browsers like Brave and stuff, but they all use, you know, the Chromium engine under the hood. Mm -hmm. And so they should fully work too. Flux works on your desktop, whether it's Linux, Mac OS or Windows. It works on your mobile or tablet, you know, whether it's iOS or Android or an iPad. It works on all these platforms, which is another great thing about putting it in the browser that like, yeah, you can bring this to the factory floor on an iPad. No problem. You can like sit commuting somewhere and quickly give somebody feedback from your phone, you know, review something. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do is um, the other morning I was walking my dog and someone pinged me for a design review. And so I was just looking at my phone while walking my dog doing a design review and like dropping comments and providing feedback to them. And I had thought like, this is crazy that we're here now because I remember I had to do a design review in China while I was there for an iPhone build. And what I had to do was I was on a bus heading to the factory and I had a 3G connection on my phone that was like, you know, 56K. And I tethered my laptop to my phone and dialed into the server and pulled it up on my computer. And what was hilarious, uh, as will give you a sense of the tools, is that I had exactly the same performance that I did at my desk. <laughs> Which at wasn't good. Right? So <laughs> yeah. Just the ability to do this on it, it was yeah, it's, it's laughable and something you want to cry over at the same time, I think. Yeah. Wow. That's right. That's right. Uh, can you track the number of active users? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we can. You mean, can I share it? Can you share that number? Yeah. Like where you're at right now? Or? I mean, you know, it's like high five digits, you know, we're growing, you know, like the last two months we've been growing 50% month of a month. If you look at the last six months, it's like on average 30% month of a month, you know, so it's, um, you know, we got our uh, work cut for us, you know, cut out for us, yeah. And this may seem like a curious question, but um, are there any surprises uh, in that data insofar as where the users are coming from? Hmm. I mean, I can share with you that, like, you know, like we alluded earlier to, like, around 40% of the user base is professional EEs. Another maybe, like, 35% or so is students or professors, you know. Uh, and then the rest is kind of like a long tail of hobbyists and people with software engineering backgrounds or project managers or, you know, those kind of roles. I mean, I think surprising in that sense is that we had this early hypothesis like I said earlier, that most that electric engineers would want this kind of product and they, they, they would adopt this as a hobby first and then bring it to work. And I think I'm surprised how right we were about that. You know, I think we, I, I, I was, I think a risk here was going into this that it would be much harder to get professionals to take us seriously and to adopt the product. And it turned out that it was easier than we thought it would. And I think on the flip side, like I said earlier too, right? Everybody told us and we knew this was going to be a, a difficult product to build, especially to build it in the browser, right? And it was even harder than we thought it was going to be. Uh, and it took longer. Like we wanted to, right, the original plan was to launch the product like a year ago. Uh, and it took 12 more months, you know, to just sort out performance issues and bugs and all sorts of, you know. Yeah, the, the thing that I'm always surprised about, I guess, is I, I always expect there to be a, a regional um, difference, but I keep expecting that to, to see South America or Africa as being out of whack on the high on the high end uh, with other regions, only because those regions that are underserved and yet still have home homegrown electronics, you know, and hardware engineers, but don't necessarily have access uh, to the tools, or the tools would be much more expensive. In, in their native country than they would be in, in the U.S. using U.S. currency. Um, I always expect that those populations would be the first to rush toward a, a system like this, right? Where the barriers to entry are low, the cost is, is low, the functionality is, is whatever you want it to be, apparently. You know, so that's why I always figure like, you know, I'd expect Kenya or, or, you know, Brazil or something like that really to be sort of out of whack relative to the rest of them in a good way. Yeah, so this is a good one, right? And in, in that sense, there is a little bit of a surprise here that I also would have thought that, you know, that the initial adoption hubs would be Asia or Africa or South America or Eastern Europe. And that's actually not been true. The majority, the vast majority of users is from North America, you know? Um, so I think, you know, the these outside hubs, you know, um, we have still to capture them. But I think, for example, for South America, we have a bunch of users there. And, you know, one thing is, is like that they're asking for is like just documentation translated in Spanish, 
which we haven't done yet, you know, which is like, you know, I mean, putting together documentation or tutorials for a product of this scale is like a lot of work to begin with. And so this is something we haven't gotten to yet, you know, to get to translations uh, in different languages, you know. Um, so I think that's like one obstacle to to adoption in these countries is just like, you know, translating. I don't think you have to translate the, the application itself so much because there isn't so much written stuff in there to begin with. Um, but the documentation for sure is uh, uh, a thing we have on the radar. That's fair. So your website is flux.ai. And uh, before we wrap, is there anything else you want to uh, to mention or share? Um, look, I think it's exciting times for people who are into electronics, into design PCBs, uh, whether you have done this for a, a life or just want to get into it, I think, you know, you, you're coming to the right place here. You know, we have a very active uh, Slack group for users, you know, where people help each other out, especially people who are getting new into this, you know. Um, so don't don't hesitate wherever you're at, you know, at your, at your journey, you know, uh, and, and come give it a shot, you know, and talk to us. And, you know, so like, I think importantly, like, look, we want to learn. We want to hear from you. We want to, of course, you're about all the things you like, and we want to also hear about the things you don't like, you know, because really we're here to to make this really great and awesome for everybody. Well, I'll remind our listeners one more time that the website of Flux is flux.ai. Our guests today have been Matthias Wagner and Carrie Sheka. And for PCB Chat, this is Mike Buto. Have a nice day. Mm-hmm.